Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the kind gesture. Well, now we're all set for our next session, which is a panel discussion. And first, I would like to call our panelists on stage. First of all, with a warm round of applause, I'd like to call Mr. H.J.S. Pasricha, Deputy Director, General, Hallmarking BIS. Mr. H.J.S. Pasricha, please. Our next panelist is Mr. Surindra Pal Singh, Joint Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs. Mr. Surendra Pal Singh, Joint Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs. Our next panelist, Mr. James Joes, Association of Gold Refineries and Mints. Mr. James Joes, Association of Gold Refineries and Mints. Our next panelist is Mrs. Surendra Mehta, National Secretary, IBJA. Like to call as a panelist, Mr. Chirag Seth, Senior Research Consultant, South Asia and Southeast Asia Metals Focus. Can we please have uh, a warm round of applause for our panelists on stage, please? And now I call the panel moderator. She is Ms. Manisha Gupta, editor, Commodities and Currencies, CNBC, TV18. Can we have a warm round of applause for Ms. Manisha Gupta, a panel moderator? I would request uh, Ms. Manisha Gupta to kindly proceed for the session. Thank you. It's a pleasure here to be here on the Gold and Jewelry Summit. Slightly delayed, but we are very, very uh, looking forward to what our panelists really have to talk. We have exciting topics to speak upon. But uh, Mr. Pasricha, I have to start with you first, because clearly there has been a lot of interest since you spoke and you uh, talked about making uh, hallmarking mandatory. There are some concerns, clearly, and I do understand that it would perhaps be phased out in a matter of one year is what we also heard the minister say. But uh, a lot of jewelry that people have at home perhaps may not be of those um, carrots or of those standards. How are you, one, looking to sort that? And a lot of jewelers, I'm assuming, uh, clearly have jewelry, which does not, again, uh, fall into that category. So what are you advising them? Uh, how much time do they have? And how do they comply to this? Thank you. Uh, as far as the jewelry, which is lying uh, with the consumers at their homes, that doesn't come in the scope of this, right? It is whatever, whenever it is notified, and there's a cutoff date, Anything which is to be sold after that has to be hallmarked. So that is really the, uh, and then there will be always be a, a time period given to, as you rightly said, that minister, honorable minister has already uh, stated this, that we'll give uh, at least may say one year time. So that is basically for exhausting the old store, stock, which is lying with the jewelers. Uh, and any other challenges we face during this period can also be resolved and we move forward. So just giving you a case study, sir, because I'm assuming because we speak to so many jewelers and so many uh, buyers as well. So if somebody has a 21 carat or a 23 carat jewelry in Maharashtra, that, that usually is the case. A lot of people buy 23 carat jewelry. So if I have to go out, sell it, repurchase, uh, clearly the old jewelry is not hallmarked. So how are you looking to bring all of that online? How do you streamline all of that? Uh, when a consumer goes to sell his old jewelry, I don't think the hallmarking is going to be applicable on that, right? It can always be sold because it has to be melted again and then made a fresh jewelry. So the fresh jewelry which is made and sold has to comply to this. So ultimately all of the jewelry will and come to be hallmarked, yes. but 
And as far as the grades are concerned, there's a technical committee in BIS, uh, which takes all the inputs from various sectors. Uh, earlier we had, uh, I think about nine grades in the standard, but it has been reduced in the interest of common man only. Because otherwise the common man doesn't come to know. The most prevalent grades which are used are 22 is the gold, and diamond studded is normally 18 or 14 carat. So those were retained by the committee. The unit, they decided it, which is this committee is represented by all the stakeholders, including the jewelry associations are also there, representatives. So there is a demand to add certain grades, as you mentioned, 23, there is a demand to re, uh, just now, and earlier also we have been receiving above 20 carat. So the committee will again have a review and uh, take a decision whether to include those grades or to keep it out. But ultimately, it is the aim is to protect the consumer's interest. That is the whole aim. Well, absolutely, sir. I totally agree with that because hallmarking will bring in a lot of credibility and transparency, which the industry clearly is looking forward to. And as we always say that any time, every time we put in a new, new law or a reform, there are some hiccups there, but clearly it is for the best of the industry. I also uh, want to move on to the demand part of it. And this year has been quite a roller coaster with the uh, global uh, movements, uh, various factors. We've seen the gold prices gain up. Demand has been hit slightly, especially in case of India. But as Alistair was also pointing out, uh, gold is bought for a lot of reasons, cultural, emotional, regional, uh, religion, and also medicinal technology. We've seen investments, global central banks buying as well. So yes, gold in that sense seems to be finding a lot of buyers there. Mr. Mehta, this question is to you. What has been uh, the kind of demand that you have seen in India, especially for this quarter, what are the expectations? And also, uh, what, what are we looking at in sense of various categories of buying here? See, as far as the last quarter is concerned, uh, I think just uh, the uh, people have seen some demand improving only just a week before Diwali, but prior to that, there was uh, the demand, I could say that demand was down by almost by 40% or 45%, even 50% in some of the southern states. Uh, if, if, I, uh, if I look at, the, there are various reasons given for uh, demand to be down. One reason being given is the price, but I don't think price is really the key factor. People in India don't uh, buy gold only for the price or the price appreciation. They buy gold because they feel that gold is a better financial product. As far as the future demand is concerned, I still feel that current year we may be down by about uh, 15 to 20 percent, but next year will match the uh, uh, expectation. Means the, if you, if I, if I have to say it, demand in 2020 should be equal to 2018 demand. Chirag, this one is to you. Uh, while, of course, we've seen gold demand slightly go down, but the other thing that actually came pretty high was the recycled gold that came into the market. What is the percentage of that that we are looking at right now? And what is your sense? Uh, is, is, this trend, is, is this trend going to keep on? Yeah, I think uh, there are multiple factors to look at. You know, recycling uh, market is a function of price as well as how the uh, economic situation is. And we've got a scenario in uh, Q3 as well as if you look at currently, the prices are higher. We are at record highs in the Indian market. Uh, also, there has been liquidity issues. Uh, you know, we travel to some tier two, tier three cities where we've seen some se serious liquidity constraints, uh, which is there. And there, you know, gold is uh, used by common man, by farmers to actually monetize uh, their holdings. So if you uh, honestly ask me, on a year-on-year -year basis, we believe that even in Q4 or Q1 2019, uh, the scrap supply would be significantly higher than what we've seen last year. I think this will only reverse once the economy starts improving, probably liquidity situation starts improving, then we'll see the normalization of uh, scrap. Uh, because if you see historically, 30 to 35% 30 to of the supply comes through secondary gold. Uh, however, what we are seeing now is this has gone up to as high as 40% for many jewelers. Uh, you know, so unless and until economic situation does not improve, uh, we may see this uh, remain elevated. The other thing that I also want to go on, and Mr. Jose, this one is to you. While uh, when you look at three to four years back, I think the Dore import was a single digit uh, percentage in sense of the overall pie. 
We've seen that double and how, uh, when we look at the data from 2018 or the first half of 2019 as well, how do you look at this pattern and do you see the Dora imports actually uh, continue going higher from here? The Dora imports have been growing by around 10% every year. Mm. So last year it touched around 40% of the country's total requirement. And this year it would have touched 50% of the total uh, bullion requirement for the country. But unfortunately because of the prices going up, the demand has come down and so much of old gold has come into the market. So the physical demand for uh, bullion has been met from the recycled market. So Dora imports have come down. Another factor is the, when the prices are going up, uh, of course there is uh, what you call the, the, when, with the duty also going up. There is a lot of gray market gold coming into the market. So there was a price discount of around uh, 4%, three to four to 5% mm -hmm. so, uh, over the past, after, immediately after the budget when the duty was increased by 2.5%. So this 5% discount vis-a-vis -vis the international price is definitely impacting the Dora supplies because we are getting Dora at international prices. So now over the past two, three months, especially in August, September, there was practically no Dora imports coming to the country. Now in October, the price of more or less stabilized and November we have seen the prices at parity. So Dora uh, imports may pick up, but this year I would uh, like to say that uh, this is the, the, the Dora imports is overall substantially low compared to last year. And uh, the scenario is not going to change because, uh, because of the cyclical, because December, January, we have the wedding season, then again we have the off season. So physical demand for uh, Dora is comparatively, or the demand for Dora bullion is met by the recycled market. So Dora imports will definitely be lower this year because of the discounts also. Um, I also want to get in Mr. Singh on the conversation. I, I, you know, one, I want you to give me an overall scenario on how do you look at the gems and jewelry sector into India right now. And also when we keep talking about this modern gold market that India is uh, coming into terms with, how, how do you see that? As far as uh, Indian uh, gold market is concerned, it's very robust and uh, it looks very uh, good uh, future for the market. And uh, 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 as you are aware that Indian uh, consumer is uh, fascinated by, I think, from time immemorial to <laughs> till date. And although there are challenges uh, like uh, imitation jewelry here, then uh, the, uh, the investment gold is also coming. In the presentation also, there was a focus on it. And young generation is, you know, focusing more on investment gold than uh, jewelry gold. And, uh, but still I uh, really uh, uh, see the Indian market in a very, very uh, good future. So, uh, the only thing is that uh, we have to uh, look at the future, uh, you know, uh, requirements and uh, things which are related uh, very closely to the culture, to the fashion, to the uh, economics also. So we, uh, as a, you know, we are exporter also uh, and we are consumer also. So our jewelers, manufacturers, traders and, you know, refiners, we have to be very, uh, you know, futuristic about our approach. So, uh, Mr. Singh, it, it's about, uh, the, the, we, have, we are looking at a lot of changes in the industry, in the market, overall, globally as well. Uh, are you looking at any policy changes, reforms that would actually support gold going forward? I mean, the, a lot of this in, is in making, hallmarking is one, gold policy is something that has been in talks forever, uh, for the last many years, rather. How are you looking at many of these uh, now moving forward? Uh, policy formation is, you know, uh, uh, as a mm, continuous process. And uh, mm, government is in the process of, you know, uh, after the uh, Niti Ayog's uh, report, uh, they had a very, very detailed uh, analysis of the Indian uh, gold market and they have submitted their uh, uh, recommendations also. And uh, uh, government is definitely looking uh, into it and uh, definitely there will be a good policy. Yeah. Uh, 
So definitely the policy changes are expected and would keep coming in as well. But I want to take it uh, more to uh, the, the kind of numbers that we have seen when it comes to demand. Uh, we, we did see September quarter as a very weak one. The couple of quarters that we have seen gone by haven't really seen much strength coming in. What is the sense going forward? As Alistair also pointed out, there is retail buying that is expected to be higher. India really seems to be inching up. We also have seen a premium coming into the markets now, uh, uh, Mr. Mehta. So from a discount and a record discount that we see in, saw in this year itself, we are back into a premium. What does that say and how much inventories are people holding and what are the expectations of final buying number really? See, definitely premium has gone up in the, la uh, in the last couple of days only because of the less import. Uh, we were down by almost 40% uh, quarter on a quarter to quarter basis. So naturally, uh, the premium has gone up because of that. People have less uh, inventory, especially the bullion market. Uh, this is one reason. Secondly, it needs to be understood that, you know, people are in this financial crunch, uh, which everyone is looking at. People are looking at some financial product and now they are finding that gold is the only product which is available. You cannot invest in real estate, you cannot invest uh, at this price and, and uh, with a lot of regulation in real estate. Uh, equity market is probably all time high, uh, but still people are losing money. So where is the other financial product available? So probably the premium are, one side there is a less import, the other side there is a huge demand for the gold. And that is why uh, huge demand for the bullion, not for the jewelry. Uh, let me correct this. And that is why I think the premium has, are going up. Mm. Uh, Mr. Pastricha, correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but uh, what we have been reporting or we keep talking about is that perhaps 40% of jewelry in India is hallmarked as of now, and that too in metros in tier one cities. So when it comes to tier two cities, tier three cities, districts, uh, what is the number, what is the feedback that you get from there? You are absolutely right. I think this is a broad estimate. Uh, even seeing the figure which I just showed that about four and a half crore articles were hallmarked uh, during the last financial year. So the scheme has uh, to really go to every town that is and to every village. But that for that I think it needs to be ultimately made mandatory. That is the only way going forward. Uh, because one is that we have about 875 hallmarking centers at the moment. They are, uh, they are located in about 234 districts of India. So we have 700 plus districts. But most of the, all the major uh, manufacturing hubs are already covered. To go to every district, I think the people have to, because these hallmarking centers are not set up by government. They are set up by private entrepreneurs, uh, wherever they uh, see a opportunity. We give only a recognition to them after assessing their capabilities. So once the scheme is announced to be made mandatory by the government, that decision is taken. I think wherever the demand is there, the entrepreneurs are going to come forward and set up and reach to the, I think, the farthest corner of the country. That is what we are anticipating. And that is what this time, uh, which the Honorable Minister has announced, that we will give some time. Mm. So I think during that time, this activity will take place because a normal hallmarking center setting up and taking recognition can be completed in about six months time. So even faster if uh, entrepreneur do, does it faster. So that is, we are expecting it that the, all the infrastructure will be there across the nook and corner, wherever the demand is there. Of course, it has to be a commercially viable project. Mm. Only then somebody will come up. Mm. So that is uh, what is anticipated that <laughs> to go to the, village level or to the smallest town level, we have to give that. That is the ultimate. So uh, this one is to you, Chirag. Once the hallmarking is made mandatory, and Mr. Pastricha was just short of actually giving us a date, but the dates that are floating out in the market are perhaps 15 December or 1st of Jan, etc. What is the immediate impact of hallmarking being mandatory do you see into the markets? What, uh, how will it impact the demand? I, I think there are uh, two things. One of the fears which when we speak with uh, jewelers and manufacturers is what is the time that they will get uh, to either mend jewelry or kind of, uh, you know, uh, recertified. I think that's that's one of the thing. But if you ask uh, over a long term perspective and you look at, and Alistair uh, made this point where 61% of 
uh, I think if I get the number right, is trust. So I think what is going to happen is that once hallmarking becomes mandatory, and we've seen that example in country after country, uh, you know, it helps in improving demand because consumers are more, uh, I would say, aware about what are the standards that are available. They have got more faith in the gold uh, that they are buying. So eventually that is going to help, uh, you know, the Indian demand uh, overall. But I would say we may not see the impact immediately. It's, it's going to take a couple of years before educational programs happens and new jewelers come on board. So uh, I would say from a demand perspective, I think that is one of the positive steps that is coming out of government regulation. Sir, I should tell you this, that uh, there was recently what we covered from Gujarat, and there was a report saying that 58% uh, people in Gujarat did not know about hallmarking, did not ask for hallmarking when they went out to buy jewelry. So I think that's yet another thing that uh, will perhaps need to be worked upon. Uh, yeah, of course, the consumer awareness has to grow. That uh, the ministry as well as BIS is making efforts, but I think we still have a lot, lot of way to go. But uh, <laughs> Gujarat, I think, fairly is yeah. still better than other places, many <laughs> okay. other places. South is the best, the five southern states, hmm. especially the Kerala, I would say. The, the awareness among the consumers is the highest. But we have to achieve that level wherever ev where every consumer starts asking for hallmark gold. But still, I think in about 19, 20 years of time, if we have reached a stage where 40% of the jewelry is voluntarily getting hallmark, hmm. it is quite a significant achievement. I, I Whereas exactly. in other countries, it has taken more than 100 years in many countries. Okay. To to I, I have to bring uh, to your notice one very important thing, other, otherwise also. This is a story from yesterday. I don't know how many of you read that, but Assam finance minister announced yesterday that uh, for every bride who's getting married, they will give them 30,000 rupees. The only thing is that the marriage has to be registered. It has to be, uh, the bride has to be more than 21 years. So just to ensure that that part is taken care of, they've said that everybody who gets married will get 30,000 rupees or one tole of gold. Mr. Jose, this one is to you. Uh, when, when you look at these kind of schemes, uh, on one side, of course, we do understand that the government does discourage physical gold buying, financialization, making it an asset class has been the push. But then this, uh, we do understand that wedding seasons and gold go hand in hand. How, how do you read this reaction from the Assam government? See, when the prices have gone up, the physical demand for gold is mostly uh, limited to the wedding purchases. The, the, the random purchases have come down. But what I feel is that Asan, when the industry becomes more transparent, like the finance minister has announced the spot exchange for gold, it has not come up. Then we need to have the India Good Delivery standards and then having the India Good Delivery buys in circulation, then uh, revamping the gold monetization scheme because once the gold is deposited with the government, what the customer get back is the, the certified biscuits, the, the gold bars. So once these all these things get into circulation, there will be more transparency for the uh, bullion business, especially for gold. And it will bring in more gold into circulation and then there will be more of investments also coming into the gold. As of now, the, uh, the, the real good, good delivery, uh, small biscuits and bars is limited to uh, towns and cities. So it has not really uh, got into circulation. So we are waiting for the spot exchange for gold, revamping the gold monetization scheme and of course the India good delivery standard in place so that the trade becomes more transparent and uh, more, more of gold coming into recirculation, uh, also as an investment option. So, Mr. Jose, of course, we've been talking about this for um, four years now that all of this needs to be done. There have been reports done from Niti Aayog. World Gold Council also has put down reports. SOMA, of course, has a whole panel coming up talking about gold policy. But how much more, uh, and in month of October also, we had heard again that there is a policy now ready, could be coming in any time. What is your sense on what is delaying it? How much more work needs to be done? And uh, why are we still waiting for this? See, we have been various stakeholders in the, in the audience also, all our associations. We have been working with the government for the past three, four years. What I believe uh, is that the, the basic framework is more or less ready. The government officials itself, they are saying that gold needs to be made an asset class. There has to be a seamless transfer of gold from uh, one segment, like if once you deposit the gold or once you have the gold, so once it, it is made an asset class, it has got a title date, just like your property or share certificate. So this title for the gold will be transferable across the segment. You can pledge it for um, uh, uh, what do you call loans, you can sell it, you can convert it to jewelry. So these type of uh, things are going to come and then only the, the trade will naturally go up. 
Chirag, this question is to you and uh, Alistair, sorry, I just keep coming back to you because you said a lot in your presentation and he made a point on how online platinum is doing better than what gold or jewelry or even silver does for that matter. Why is that? Uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the things is uh, if you look at the consumer of platinum, it's largely millennials. Uh, whereas if you look at gold, the age group that you're looking at, and we did this uh, study about a year ago where we met about 50, 60 jewelers, and we tried to understand what was the demographics that were buying gold. And most, and, uh, most of the jewelers that we spoke with said uh, their consumers are 35 plus. Whereas if you ask a jeweler who sells platinum, they'll tell you most of the consumers are 28, 20 year old, 25 year old. So I think it, it all depends upon what is the kind of consumer who is buying that. Uh, mind you, gold jewelry is also doing well online. You know, we've seen 15 to 20% growth on an online platform. Uh, you speak with Amazons and Flipkarts of the world, they've uh, reported double digit growth. Uh, but the price point is much lower. You know, their price point is 10,000, 5,000, 15,000 rupees. I think the difference between gold and platinum online is the kind of consumer that is buying 